Stop chasing the hype. In a market where the Pioneer tax and Moran's premium have gone completely out of control, you are overlooking the real champion. This is the Kenwood KA3500. It is without a doubt the giant killer of the golden era. It stands toe to toe with the big boys in specs, build quality, and pure performance for a fraction of the price. Similar models from Pioneer. Marantz and Sansui are going for two and three times as much as this Kenwood. For you guys out there who work on your own equipment or who would like to, this is a dream machine. It features an intelligent layout and incredible serviceability that makes restoration a joy, not a headache. Today, I'm taking this unappreciated legend, giving it a full restoration, and putting it on the test bench to prove exactly why this is the best value in vintage audio. Period. Let's get started on this amazing integrated amplifier. Before you start to restore or repair any vintage piece of equipment, you should go in and test it out the best you can. Go in and make sure that you understand what's working, what's not working, so when you get in there and to start to do a restoration or you're in there doing a repair, that you didn't break something. So you know exactly what's working and what's not before you get started. Everything checked out fine, so I'm ready to start the restoration. I'm gonna be changing out those 50 year old electrolytic capacitors some people feel that's unnecessary, but I'm not one of those people. You can see this guy here is pretty easy to deal with. So we got to remove these guys here to get to, to the inside there. One thing that's kind of cool here, you undo these screws and this whole front panel will pull right on out and slide down for you and down and out and here you can see there's a ton of room in here which makes it real nice to uh, be able to work on this this unit isn't very large to begin with and when you have in addition to it not being large and it coming apart like this it makes it quite nice with all the fasteners removed at the front of the uh, ka3500 these even though they're all wired together, all these boards will kind of come out together. At least I think they will. They normally do. You can see they're kind of wired together here, but everybody's loose. And you just got to take your time here and just get these removed out. All of these assemblies are now loose in here. And actually this here, what should I do? Right? This, this front piece, what I can do is just take it right off. It'll give me a lot more room if I remove this front piece right off of here, or at least move it out of the way. And I think now this is out of the way enough. Um, I don't know if you can see, but look at these assemblies that are right here in front of me now. That's going to be quite easy to get to, and I don't have to remove any of this point-to-point -point wiring. As I said in the 70s, this is how they wired them, and uh, just soon not mess with that. You know, you shouldn't bend these back and forth a hundred times, but I won't have to in this case, because I can get right to everybody. So, I don't know how well y'all can see this, probably can see it, but um, you can see various electrolytic capacitors on the board and I'm able to get to both sides now, this side and also to the solder side of these uh, assemblies and this one too. So I'm going to get started with the uh, capacitor change. This Hacko desoldering tool makes any rework so much easier. I'm just going to show you here how easy this tool works or try to show you to remove components. If you have a lot of them to remove, boy, this is a godsend. I mean, it just sucked the solder right out of there. I'm going to do this other one. Here we go. I wiggle it a little bit. Didn't even really need to, but here we go. You can probably see that, that uh, just took it right on, took it right on out. We've got the capacitors changed out. The first assembly here, the uh, 1530 assembly. And we're just going to move on here and uh, do the other part of the 1530. It's all one assembly. They call it one assembly. Uh, they have one assembly designation for it, the 1530. So we're going to go ahead and continue on. We've got some electrolytic capacitors over here that we need to change out. So 
Okay, I've got the preamp uh, all finished up, the 1530 preamp assembly. I also changed out the electrolytic capacitors in the 1470 power amp assembly, which sits at the bottom of the KA3500. Just like the preamp section, there's a lot of room. You just have to take out a few fasteners, and you can get the uh, power amp assembly in a position to work on it. I got the electrolytic capacitors changed out, and so I wrapped everything back up. I got it back together. I hooked it up with a Yamaha K700 cassette deck just to do some testing. Anytime you do as much work as I just did on it, there's a chance that you've got a problem. And so you don't want to just assume you did everything right, everything went smoothly. I thought everything was okay. But you've got to go ahead and try it out, obviously, before you go on any further. So that's what I did and hadn't ran my uh, cassette deck here in a while, this K700. And so I put them together and, uh, boy, they sounded really good together. So now it's time to move on. First, I'm going to check out the DC offset on the test bench. At the top left of the screen, you're going to see a multimeter that's going to be capturing the DC offset voltage. This data will be captured in real time. These two graphs, the left channel will be at the left side, the right channel will be at the right side, and each of these graphs have these columns, and this is going to show you the millivolts that the DC offset is set at, and this horizontal column is going to be the runtime. Right now, all we're doing is reading random garbage because I haven't powered up the KA3500 yet. Okay, I just went ahead and powered it up. Now take a look at the voltage, the DC offset. It's about 45 millivolts. You can see on the chart how it spiked way up to, oh, 50, 60, 70 millivolts, but then it started to settle down, and now it's starting to settle as the time goes on. And, you know, we're running somewhere around in the middle 20s, somewhere like that, 20 millivolts. Uh, you can see both on the meter and also on the charts how both channels are just kind of settling down. So that big spike there in the middle is a normal thing to have happen. They'll jump up sometimes several hundred millivolts just for a split second until they settle down. You can see from the timeline at the bottom of these charts that it only took it a few seconds really to settle in, less than a minute. And I can tell you without having you watch this that it doesn't matter how long you watch, you can watch it for an hour and it's gonna stay between 25 and 30 millivolts. So you guys who are from Familiar with DC offset specifications, you guys know that you want to get it as close to zero millivolts of DC on your speaker outputs as you can. And you're probably thinking, well, 25 to 30, that's not terrible, but why don't you go ahead and adjust the DC offset pots and adjust it down to closer to zero? Well, you can't because there are no adjustments for the DC offset. And here's a post from a guy called Echo Wars from Audio Karma. This guy is a vintage audio guru. Now he's disappeared from Audio Karma over the last five years, but he's got thousands of posts that if you need to know anything about amplifiers, he's the guy to go look up on Audio Karma. He's posting in response to somebody who has trouble with a KA3500, but take a look at that first paragraph. On DC coupled amps with a differential input stage, this differential pair of transistors is responsible for zeroing out the offset the best it can. How well this is accomplished depends on a list of factors, one of which is the matching of the gain of these two transistors, and another is the amount of base current required to bias these transistors. But on a KA3500, even with closely matched transistors in the differential pair, about the best that can be hoped for is about 30 millivolts or so. So this KA3500 is running between 25 and 30 mill millivolts of DC offset, and as Echo War said, you're not going to get any better than that. So if you can't find your DC offset pots on a piece of equipment that you own, make sure you do a little bit of research that you even have them. The KA3500 does have bias adjustments, and that is in the service manual. And then I went to set the bias uh, on the amplifier, and I had a problem. The right channel, I could set the bias, no problem. On the left channel, I only had about a millivolt and a half. So I knew I had a problem, and I troubleshot that, and it ended up being a 2SA872 transistor on the power amp board, Q9, that was causing the problem. So when I got that fixed up, 
I had no problem setting the amp up and had 40 about 40 millivolts on both channels. A lot of these old pieces of equipment, the majority I see they're broke in some manner. See, and this is what a lot of people say, it works great. Sure enough, I had sound from both my left and right channel, but I didn't know till later that I had, I couldn't bias the amplifier correctly. And that's one of those things that I believe a lot of people talk about a particular vintage unit sounds better or sounds worse than some others. They've got something broke and they don't even realize it. So with that problem solved, it's time to move on to some bench testing. The Sound Technology 3200A audio analyzer, even though it's vintage itself, is an excellent way to test any amplifier. I'll use the volume control on the K3500 so I can look at different power levels and see how that affects the distortion of the amplifier, as well as showing how well the channels are balanced with each other. Here I'm showing the left channel and the right channel together, and as I rotate the volume control, you can see the power levels keep going up. I'm up at about 6 watts here. Now, one more time up, up about 8 watts, and you can see how the two channels are just tracking together, and I'm just walking this up as I go along, and I'm up at 32 watts a channel. Now I'm almost at the limits of the amplifier, so I'm just backing it back down now, and just seeing how well balanced the channels are, how close are they together. Now I'm going to take a look at the total harmonic distortion of both the channels. The channel A is the left channel, Channel B is the right channel, and so now I've selected channel A, which is the left channel, and it shows it's about at 6.73 watts, about 0.04 distortion. I've moved over to the right channel, and it shows again about 0.04% distortion at 7 watts continuous. And remember, this integrated amplifier has a spec of 0.2. So this distortion measurement is well under its rated 0.2%. Now I've moved it up to about 15 watts per channel, and it's 0.06. Now I've moved it up to about 32 watts per channel, and now we're at 0.136, still well under the 0.2. And I've started to back it down a little bit, and you can see this amplifier is easily meeting its specifications at various power levels. Now I've moved it back to the left channel, and the left channel did just as well, if not slightly better, than the right channel, as far as distortion figures. But they were both excellent. There are also modern audio analyzers that do a great job with testing vintage audio equipment. The modern audio analyzers are much smaller physically, and also are completely software driven. The modern audio analyzers are much more flexible than the older ones, and they just provide you with a lot of data that you wouldn't have had years ago. Such as a built-in oscilloscope, which you can save the data from, put it in a file, recall it, compare it to other data that you've saved. A common specification you'll see in your owner's manual is frequency response. Also, you can do tests on distortion to frequency. Just a minute ago, I showed you the power versus distortion test on the vintage auto analyzer, the ST3200A. Let me show you how that would run on a modern audio analyzer performing the exact same test. Again, 1000 hertz, 8 ohm load, and let's see what it does. Going to hit the start button. And it's running, and there it goes. And it's still going, and it's still going, and up here it says it's finished. And if we move this back this way, and maybe this out a little bit, here's 50 volts here, here's 20. Again, we started at a tenth of a volt, I mean a tenth of a watt, and we ran it out to 45 watts. The left channel just a hair over 0.1. And it looks like about 0.11. And again, it was running in the 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, both channels. And here it is running all the way up to 40 watts a channel, well under 0.1%. That's quite good, seeing that the amplifier is rated for 40 uh, watts at 0.2. So let's go ahead while I got this going. Why don't we change this to 45? Let's see what happens. At some point, we're going to clip here. I don't know when that's going to be, but we're going to find out. Let's go 45, not get too crazy. Hit the start button, and here we go. You can see it running across the screen, probably, as it's going along. And it's done again. And this time, it got just about the same. About 0.09 and point, uh, yeah, about 0.094 and 0.093. So still under 0.1 up to 45 watts a channel, and it's rated at 40. So let's get brave here and go for 50. At some point, this is going to roll over. If it rolls over, this shouldn't be too horrible. So we can go ahead and change it to 50. Again, we're starting at 
100 milliwatts and we're going to run it now to 50 uh, watts per channel. Let's see what it does. And there it goes, and there it goes. It's going, it's going. We'll see what happens when it gets here to the end. Whoops! <laughs> well, we saw what happened. See over here at the right, it went, uh, it certainly rolled over. It, it rolled over uh, pretty good. You know, went over to one over 1% 1 and well over its spec, which would have been right in here. So 50 was too much for it. 40, 45 even was fine, but 50, 50 did it in. There's so much more flexibility with the modern audio analyzers. You take a look at this graph, both on the left side and the right side. You've just got some boxes, and you can just put in whatever you want. What I was doing was a power test. I could have started at any power level I wanted and ended at any power level. And you saw me change the maximum power level when I was testing the uh, 3500. But on the vintage audio analyzer, everything's manual. You've got to go ahead and push buttons. You've got to manually increase or decrease the input level to the amplifier there's a lot more hands-on work where with the modern audio analyzer and the software a lot of it is just fill in the boxes and hit a button and the software takes care of the rest I feel the KA3500 is an outstanding integrated amplifier. It's got enough power for most people. It performed well, meeting or beating its published specs. It's got enough inputs again for most people. Supports a turntable, got an auxiliary, tuner, along with two tape decks. Again, for most folks, that's going to be good. In addition, you saw if you ever have to work on it. It's about the most technician-friendly piece of equipment I've ever worked on. Not that you're going to have to work on it any more than you would a Pioneer or Sansui or a Marantz because it's built with the same quality, the same engineering that went into those name brands. With operating Kenwood KA3500 selling on eBay in the $150 to $200 range, this has to be one of the bargains still out there in vintage audio. If you enjoyed this video, please click that like button. And if you're not a subscriber, I'd appreciate it if you considered it. And as always, I appreciate my present subscribers and thank you so much for hanging in there with me. Y'all have a good day.